<clears throat> hey everybody, it's Dr. Morris again. Um, if you can't tell by this, we're going to talk about skin diseases um, and talk about things that make you itch or not itch. So we have a little game for you. So if you want to um, have a piece of paper in front of you or um, just think about it in your head, you can, you can do either one of those. So we're going to talk about um, if you know the common external parasites now. So name the external parasite that um, it's going to be like in first person. So one type of knee can in inject a toxin that causes ascending motor paralysis, causing my host to not be able to walk. But if all of me are removed, the host will get better in 72 hours. Hopefully you guys know the answer with that. Um, Another clue, I am roundish and come in many shades of brown. Some of us have decorations on our scutum, which is the back of this parasite. Many different types, um, different genus and species of this parasite. They have four life stages, and all of them suck blood from, different, from a different animal each time while they are developing. So their life, life cycle goes from one animal, they suck blood from that animal, they drop off, and they have to suck blood from another animal in order to develop into the adult. So I'm sure you guys knew that that was a tick. Um, they can cause an area, infection, area of infection at the bite spot if they're not properly removed. And it's ideal to remove them within 72 hours or else you'll get certain diseases like Lyme disease. Um, the longer they stay attached, the more chances are that you'll be infected with um, certain diseases like Lyme disease, um, blood-borne parasites like Ehrlichia and Babesiosis, Anaplasma, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, um, and Tick Paralysis. So we do see some of them here that will have a tick on them, but we don't know that they have a tick on them. They will be able to walk, and we remove the tick or you know, do a, a, clear, a clean search for um, anything, and they will remove the tick, and they'll do fine. So the bottom tick is the dermacenter tick, and that is the one that can be inside. So these, these are the ones that we worry about in shelters that can cause a Rocky Mountain spotted fever um, and tick paralysis. So we watch out for those. Sometimes people can treat their shelters or not. Um, we use Epitix here, which will, will prevent fleas and ticks on our dogs. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So just figure out what, what works for you. Next one. Um, I don't think this video will work, but um, this particular parasite can cause intense, intense pruritus, which is itchiness, and it can elicit a penalpedal reflex. Sorry for my, my speech problems right now. I've been doing a bunch of lectures today. Um, so do you, anyone know what this is? I don't have the picture, but a penalpedal reflex is when you, are, you kind of flip over the dogs or cats um, ear pinna, so the floppy part of their ear. You turn it over. You kind of fold it together and you rub it, and then if they're really, really itchy and they have this parasite, it is um, known that they will kick their back leg. So pinnal is the ear and pedal is the foot. So if you rub the ear, they'll kick their back leg. And that is when you can diagnose, um, oh wait, sorry, we're going to have some more clues. So this parasite is highly contagious between dogs and rarely seen in cats, but it's zoonotic. You need a microscope to see me, but I'm not, but I'm very difficult to find. Um, my incubation period is 10 days to eight weeks, so I might be on your, might be in, in your environment and not be showing signs until eight weeks later. And I spend the entire life on the animal, the same animal. So in contrast to ticks, this parasite stays on the same animal its entire life. So this is Sarcoptic scabii, Sarcoptic scabii, um, which is Sarcoptic mange. Um, it can cause the penalpedal reflex and um, cause intense pruritus. So these are the really, really itchy, itchy animals. Um, it's difficult to find, um, but if you have an itchy animal that has these hair loss lesions and the redness, then, you, then we worry about Sarcoptes, especially since it's contagious to people. And then if you want to read that cute little um, or gross <laughs> cartoon at the top. Another picture of the zoomed in areas. Um, it's 
not really specific to sarcoptic mange because you can have in, in bacterial infections and other um, skin diseases look like this. But if you have a really itchy animal that has hair loss and redness, worry about sarcoptic mange, especially in your younger animals. All right, next one. I can jump onto a nursing puppy from the mother dog within the first 72 hours of birth. I'm usually not itchy, but with severe infestations, I damage the skin, allowing for secondary bacterial infection, which in turn are itchy. I normally live in the hair follicles and oil-producing glands of the skin, but when an animal's immune system is lower, I flourish and multiply, causing hair loss. Extra point questions. Oh, so I guess I should tell you what this is. So we're talking about um, Demodex. So Demodectic mange is another mite that you can see underneath a microscope. So the question is, is it contagious? So is Demodec Demodectic mange contagious? The answer is no for that. It's not contagious among, among animals. Um, and where are the lesions most likely found? So this is kind of a generalized hair loss on this dog. Uh, but they can be patchy hair loss like this dog. You often see them around the ocular area, so you'll see hair loss right around the eyes. Um, you can see it on their paw pads. Uh, usually we're seeing them at the, the bad stage, like they've had them for a while, and you, you probably are seeing the same thing, so it could look like anything. So they have the generalized, meaning all over the place, hair loss. Um, it's not specific to those particular spots of the eyes and the toes. Um, so we can do a skin scrape to show where um, to, to show what it is. So, okay, what test do you use to find Demodex? Skin scrape. So this is what they look like underneath the skin, underneath the microscope. Um, I think Dr. Bice will go over how to do skin scrapes, but there are videos online you can use. This is something that you can do in your shelter. It's pretty easy. Um, you just have to be trained to do it. Um, and, and determine which is the best way to do it so that you can find Demodex so you're not wasting your time. If you're doing skin scrapes and it's not working, maybe you're not doing it properly um, because it's highly prevalent in the, in the shelter situation. Because of the stress and the younger animals that we get in, their immune system is lowered, oftentimes with stress or other diseases, so they'll, they'll have a, <clears throat> a Demodex infestation. So that's what they look like. Extra point question. What other tests can you find, can you use to find Demodex in a cat? So just think about this for a little bit. I'm going to take a sip of tea. <clears throat> All right, anybody know the answer? So think about what a cat does. It's on the fur. So if the cat's licking a lot and grooming a lot, you might be able to find them in the feces. So do the same kind of fecal flow that you would do looking for intestinal parasites, and you can find the demodectic mite, maybe parts of it, maybe whole mites on the, on the skin or on the, in the fecal sample. So this is our um, dog named Rich that was from our Pets for Life community, um, highly infested with demodex. Um, this dog was itchy, even though demodex is not itchy, because it has the severe chronic um, skin presentation that is from chronic in, uh, bacterial and fungal infections from the Demonex. So the Demonex disrupts the skin, allows the body to, um, or doesn't allow the body to fight against the bacterial and fungal infections, and those proliferate and cause the crustiness, the redness, the patches of hair loss, um, and the itchiness. So that's what he looked like in 2014 in July, and this is um, just a month later with our treatment here. So there's a few things you can use to treat Demonex. We're using um, a, a Brevecto, which is a three-month flea prevention that is an off-label treatment for Demodex. So make sure you pass it by your veterinarian and have the protocols written. Um, or Symperica or NexGuard are other two um, flea preventions that you can use to treat Demodex. Um, they also say it treats sarcoptic mange too, so um, why not? Why not use it? Because you, you can do either one if you can't find the sarcoptic mange. And this is rich now. Well, maybe not now. I think this was probably a year ago or two years ago. Um, we've tested him for endocrine problems since he's a little bit overweight now, and he's fine. And his hair is flourishing, as you can see. So it is a treatable disease, and they do well with it. All right, next parasite. 
I am a mite with a nickname Walking Dandruff. Different species in infect dogs, cats, and rabbits. I cause scaling and pruritus along the dorsum of cats. I can infest humans. And that's what this mite looks like. Has anyone seen this mite? It looks like walking dandruff. So it looks like the cat or dog um, has little specks of dandruff that are walking around. Sometimes you can see it, sometimes you can't. So Chylotiella species is what um, that is. They live on the host for their entire life cycle, just like um, sarcoptic mange does. They can cause the scaling and pruritus, so itchiness along the dorsum of cats. Um, oftentimes you can see them, but sometimes you can't. So you can do a tape impression smear. So if you see these little flakes on the on the dog or cat and you're not quite sure what they are and you can't see them moving, and everybody's eyesight is not as good um, as some, so you can't really, really see them, you take a, a clear piece of tape, put it on the area that you're concerned about, take it off and put it under a microscope. Put it on the microscope slide and look at it under a microscope. Sometimes you can see this mite. Or you can see some other things that we'll talk about too. So Chylotiella, look out for that. 95% of my relatives live in grass, crevices, floorboards, carpet, and fabric. I can lay 40 to 50 eggs a day, and these eggs can lay dormant in, for months. They hatch when the environment is warm, humid, and they feel vibrations. As an adult, I like to bite the skin of furry animals and suck blood, causing anemia and my saliva can cause an allergic skin reaction. It's a flea, so I didn't give you enough time, but um, I'm sure you guys knew that that was a flea. They can also carry um, certain parasites that we have to worry about. They can carry rickettsial parasites, Bartonella, Mycoplasma, um, Uracinia pestis is the plague. We don't really see that very often, but, but we do have to worry about fleas carrying them. And of course, we talked about the Diphlidium caninum, which is a tapeworm that will get your adopters a little worried about um, two, to, two to 14 days later after they take the animal home, they might show signs of a tapeworm in their feces. So the best way to get rid of fleas is to treat the environment. Can't get ahead of it if the environment is infested with them. Um, it'll just keep, keep reproducing and, and, and keep jumping on your, your dogs and cats. Um, so treat the environment and use flea prevention year-round. I am either a blood-sucking type or a chewing type, and I am host-specific. So that means that this particular organism will only be on the dog or only be on the cat and cannot cross-contaminate between species. It's not zoonotic. Trichodectes canis is a chewing type and it can carry the common tapeworm as well as the flea, the same as the flea. More common in warmer environments and associated with poor health. And it causes the dog to itch and bite at the skin, which causes a rough, matted coat. This is what it looks like. This is a couple puppies that came in with it. So puppies are highly susceptible to this because their immune system's lowered and they're stressed when they're here. So they can get this parasite pretty easily from their litter mates, from their mother. Um, they can, it's, it's contagious through species, but not you, can, like, you cannot get it from the dog. Oh, this is a cool video of them um, walking around. So this is a, I think this is a tape, tape smear, or tape impression smear. So you take the tape, clear tape if you have it, um, go over the little white specks that are on the animal, Grab a couple of those white specks on the tape, put the tape on the microscope slide, and put the microscope slide underneath the microscope, and you can see these little things crawling around. So this is a chewing type of lice. So that is a louse, or three lice animals um, crawling around in there. So here's the two different types. So there's a sucking lice, blood sucking lice. As you can see, there's, they have a different mouth part. So the blood sucking lice has, louse has a, um, a smaller, skinnier, skinnier nose, so it can suck up the, the blood. Um, the chewing lice 
has a wider mandible and jaw, so it can just start biting and biting and biting. Um, and sometimes you can see the little um, egg packet on a trichogram. So if you pick a couple of the hairs, you can put that underneath a microscope slide, and you can see these little egg packets, which are shown in the, the left picture there. I think that um, is it for that organism. All right. Next one is, um, has a scientific name as Microsporum canis, Microsporum gypsum, and Trichophyton. Some people will know it with just that clue. Um, this one may not cause the animal, may or may not cause the animal to be itchy. More common in young kittens and less common in adult dogs. And can persist in carriers, furniture, carpets, dust, feeding vents, furnished filters, and the like, all over the place, obviously. And it can affect animals housed in a contaminated environment months to even years later. So it's highly persistent in the environment. Anybody think about it? All right, so we're talking about ringworm. So there are a couple different species. So this is a fungus, it's not a mite, it's not a tick. Um, it's a fungal infection. Um, dogs will most likely get uh, the species called Microsporum canis or Microsporum gypsum or trichophyton. Um, in dogs, 70% of the cases are caused by Microsporum canis. Yep, 20% and then 10%. Um, in cats, 98% are caused by Microsporum canis. The good thing about that is that Microsporum canis is the one that glows under the black light or the wood lamp. Um, so that's the one we have to worry about in shelters. Um, trichophyton is also thought to be contracted mainly from exposure to rodent nests. Uh, Microsporum gypsum is from contaminated soil, um, but also can be spread from animal to animal in the contaminated environment. Um, and then Microsporum canis, which is the one we worry about most, is often spread from contact with an infected animal or the contaminated environment. So it can live in the environment for a while. Um, so that's why it causes a serious problem in shelters. It can, uh, let's see, what else? The incubation period for a ringworm can be anywhere from four days to four weeks. So you might have kittens that are exposed in your shelter or exposed out wherever they came from. And then you adopt them out two weeks later, and then they'll come back with, with lesions because it takes two to four weeks, four, four, excuse me, four days to four weeks to show signs. Um, is that all transmitted through? Yep. So how do you diagnose ringworm? A few ways you can do it. Wood's lamp is one of the ways that we, we should be doing it in all shelters. Of course, that's only going to get 70% of the dog cases of ringworm because that Microsporum canis is the only one that will glow underneath a wood's lamp. Um, good thing is that 98% of the cats that come in here will have the Microsporum canis species, so wood's lamp is ideal for them. You can do a direct exam of the hair underneath the microscope. So like we talked about with the, with the louse, you can pick, pick the hairs of the dog or cat, um, put it under a microscope, and you can see a specific finding under the microscope that would indicate if it's ringworm or not ringworm. You can do a fungal culture, so a dermatophytosis um, medium is what you need. So a DTM is what we call it. Uh, that often takes a little while, so it can take up to two weeks for you to see any changes. And of course, that's not always feasible in the shelter situation um, because this is a highly contagious thing and you need, a, need to have an isolation ward for this particular disease only. Um, and then PCR is a fairly new thing. Um, IDEX is doing it for us here. We pluck the hairs like you would do for a direct hair exam. You put it in a clean, sterile vial. And you can send that off to IDEX and request a PCR, which is a, a very intense test to determine if there are DNA, um, DNA pieces of the like pieces of DNA of the ringworm. Uh, their their IDEX lab will be able to figure out if there if there's DNA in the sample. Uh, that will only take two to three days, so it's pretty feasible for us to do that here. Um, if you have the funding for it, I think it's like $30 here. So um, sometimes it's a good idea to do that just so you know what you're, what you're getting into um, and if you, if you have that disease or not before you make any decisions. Of course, you have to isolate them first if you're worried about it. But um, again, this is another thing that you can develop a protocol so that everybody's on the same page. 
All right, so what's lamp? Fluorescence about 30 to 80 percent of the microsporum canis species. They um, will show a bright apple green color uh, along the hair shaft of the particular hairs that are affected. So you look the animal all over. The lesions often happen on the face, the feet, the belly, and inside the ears, um, sometimes at the tip of the tail, too. So um, look for any hair loss on the animal, um, specifically woods lamp those areas, or just woods lamp the whole entire cat, because the, the hair loss might not be visible quite yet. You can see the ringworm before the hair loss occurs. Um, we do worry about misdiagnosis, so some of the tetracyclines that we use, like doxycycline, and some of the ointments that have particular materials in them can fluoresce too. Um, some of the food can fluoresce that's around their muzzle. Um, so just rinse off anything uh, just to get a clear picture of if what you're looking at is ringworm. These are some cool pictures from Dr. Newberry's article. You can kind of see, so the picture on the left, you can see just the hair shaft is glowing. Um, picture in the middle is, is kind of obvious. It's that like apple green color and the picture on the right is more descriptive of that um, apple green color. Um, this is a close-up view of, of ringworm. So usually you can see it at, at coating the, the hair shaft. So these, you can see that there's not hair loss in this cat, that this cat has hair, um, but you can see the ringworm just along the bottom of the hair. So it takes a little bit of time to get used to it, um, but it's really, really reliable. This is a kitty that we had for surgery. Um, we saw these hair loss lesions. We're like, good goodness, that's really, really, really concerning. It's going to be in our shelter for a little bit. Um, I think this was an owned cat. So we see the lesions without the woods lamp, so right around the eyes, right underneath the ear, um, some of the lesions on the nose and at the top of the head. So we used a woods lamp, and it's not as best uh, my view right here, but you can see just above the eye, you can see these little like streaks of apple green color, and you, so we were diagnosing this cat with ringworm off of a woods lamp. Um, this was a spot on the top of its head. If you can see in the very middle of the picture, there's a little apple green coloring there. If you can see that. Hopefully you can. Maybe you can turn the lights off in your room and then make it, make it more visible. Um, so this is a direct exam, which I call the trichogram. So this is plucking a couple of the hairs. So in that puppy, you would pluck the hairs just on the outer circle of the hair loss lesion. So you pluck those hairs, you put them under a microscope, and you would see um, the different changes. Let me see if I have a better slide. Yep, so you will see these circular um, areas along the hair shaft. So the top left is a normal, normal hair. It should just look like that. It should be really, really smooth along the outer edges. It should, so it shouldn't look like anything's damaged on the hair shaft. But then on the bottom, you can see the little spores of the ringworm along the outside of the hair. Hopefully, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, if you do come here, we can show you. And then DTM culture is most common. You take a hair pluck um, from the hair loss area, put it in the middle of the culture, and see the color change. So growth usually occurs in about a w one week. Um, we can wait up to two weeks. Not all of the ringworm species can turn the test medium red, so false negatives are always possible. Um, so other types of non-pathogenic fungi, fungus species can cause a red change. So you can't just determine a positive test by the change in color of the, the medium. You have, to, um, you, have, you have to look under a microscope. So you take the whole, you can take the whole medium, don't even open it, don't even risk the contamination, put it under the microscope, and you'll see these canoe-like microconidiae, which is the, the picture on the bottom right. So that's what you would see under the microscope if you have this ringworm species. Okay, hopefully that would help. There is another, you can, you can take part of that sample and put it on a microscope slide and, and use a specific stain to put on the slide to see this beautiful picture, um, but oftentimes you can see it just by looking under the microscope with the DTM culture medium that cassette. All right, um, again, like we talked about with the upper respiratory infections, is this something that you can treat? 
So things to consider when you're thinking about this is it persists in the environment for a very long time. It's highly contagious and it's zoonotic. So oftentimes those things are, are pretty concerning and um, it's not something that everybody's able to treat. Uh, it's costly, it's time consuming, and it takes a long time. So our treatment that we usually start if we find a positive um, suspicion of ringworm, we start a antifungal and we will do that for at least a month or two months, sometimes it's even three months. We wait until the um, hair loss comes back and they're no longer what's lamp positive. Sometimes we'll redo a DTM or a direct exam just to make sure everything is okay. So multiple tests, they have to be in your shelter for a very long time or you can send them out to foster. Um, so some of our protocols to prevent um, bringing in an animal that is positive for a ringworm into the shelter, of course, you're never going to know because the incubation period could be up to four weeks. So it's, um, it's best to do walkthroughs, make sure you're keeping an eye out for ringworm lesions and things like that. But um, we woods lamp all kittens when they come in at intake. If they're positive, we'll either pull a DTM or do a PCR, depending on um, cost and if we have if we have the ability to isolate them at the time. Um, we will lime dip all puppies, and I would love to start to lime dip all kittens as well, just more time consuming. Um, and we also skin scrape all hair loss lesions. So, so especially with the dogs, because ringworm's not as common with an older dog, um, we will have them skin scrape the dog. As soon as it comes in, if it shows with any kind of hair loss, we'll skin scrape them, and sometimes we can diagnose Demodex right off the bat and not have to worry about ringworm. Or they could have concurrent infections with ringworm and Demodex. So, um, these, are, these are things that you can catch pretty early. Uh, and then specifically mark the lesion. So if you see a kitten that comes in with hair loss around its eye, make sure you mark that down in its record. You can, you can print out or create some kind of chart like I have on the right where you can circle where the lesions are just so you know. Um, the next person knows when they're going to look at the animal to make sure it's getting over the, the ringworm. They can determine where the ringworm was, what day it was marked down as, and then um, see if it's getting better or getting worse, because they might show up with new hair loss lesions. All right, I wanted to um, briefly go over some other um, presentations that you may see of skin. So this dog came in with some hair loss on its back area. I think it also had an embedded collar, as you can see at the top. Um, maybe some redness around the ears, probably had some redness on its belly too. Um, this could be a numerous bunch of things, but we, we could um, chalk this up to flea infestation. So sometimes we'll get, have an allergy to fleas um, that will show up as itchiness around the dorsum and cause hair loss on the dorsal area and then a secondary bacterial infection. So once you treat the bacterial infection and the fungal infection, um, then you can either, you'll see an underlying problem or everything will go away. So this is one that you would talk to the adopters about, possibly an allergy to fleas, an allergy to food, and an allergy to environment. Um, they're adoptable. There's no reason why you shouldn't adopt these, these animals out. Um, it, it, you can even help them with just a simple medicated shampoo or bath twice a week. Um, and make sure you can, you can use flea prevention. So hopefully that's in your intake protocols as well. Um, and then this is a puppy that looks otherwise normal on if he was just standing there in the cage. But when we do a further exam, we looked underneath in his inguinal area and we saw these little red bumps. Um, I can't tell you exactly what it is. Sometimes we don't, just, we don't diagnose 100%. We will treat for what looks like a bacterial infection. And if it goes away, then it probably was a bacterial infection. So I don't know if this dog got into some fire ants or something or had some contact allergy with something that it was rubbing on outside. Unfortunately, we don't know the history of all the animals, but it looks red and irritated, um, probably infected. You can always do an impression smear. So you take the microscope slide, push it on the area that is infected or of concern, um, and then stain that like you would do an ear cytology slide with those particular stains. And you can see if it's bacterial or malassezia, which is the yeast that will grow on skin. So a bunch of things you can do in-house to diagnose one or, over the other. It's ideal to, to make a diagnosis just so you're not using antibiotics all the time, um, so we don't create any resistance. But um, it's not always feasible. And if it's, if it looks like 
uh, bacterial or fungal infection, then your veterinarians will, will probably start medications. All right, so talking about adoption. So most skin diseases are adoptable. Of course, you have to worry about ringworm. Um, a lot of times you need to treat the ringworm completely before adopting them out because it is a contagious disease and, um, and it's not always feasible for adopters to take that on. But anyway, um, adoption disclosure is always good with any of these diseases. It should accompany any animal that's being treated for a disease, um, especially those that are zoonotic. Uh, again, ASV states that all animals enter the shelter are infected with internal and external parasites, so it's always good to disclose that information um, so that they do follow up with their veterinarian, possibly for more deworming if they need them, an additional medication for one of the intestinal parasites that you might have diagnosed. Um, again, whipworms is usually requires a two treatment protocol, so three days in-house treatment or in-home in treatment, um, just with Panicure orally, and then uh, they usually recommend three weeks later to do another treatment, and then even three months later after that to do another treatment. It's not always feasible for us to take care of that as a shelter, so it is ideal to ask the, the new adopters to take that on themselves. But you have to disclose everything, make sure they have all that information and understand it, and go to their um, veterinarian. So we encourage veterinary visits. Um, some shelters and some area veterinarians will offer free visits for uh, an adopted animal um, that always gets them through the door so that they can establish a relationship with their veterinarian um, or with a, a veterinarian so that they can continue with care. All right. Um, just another thing that we can, we can see sometimes in, in cats um, in a shelter situation just due to stress. So there's a disease um, or condition called psychogenic alopecia. That is when you will see the, the sides of the cat and underneath the cat be kind of have thin hair and hair loss. Um, it is due to constant grooming. So they groom normally and that's completely fine. But in a stressful situation, the cat can groom constantly. It's kind of a, a comfort factor. They're grooming constantly and causing the hair loss. Um, they might, of course, have more hair balls. They could get secondary bacterial infections because they're grooming themselves and breaking up that skin barrier. Um, but oftentimes you'll just see them with this like hair thinning on their sides. Um, of course, you want to rule out everything else. You want to rule out um, ringworm. You want to rule out any kind of in infectious, contagious mite, um, chylotiella, which is the walking dandruff. You want to rule out all the other things um, with our simple tests in-house. You know, a trichogram. You can do a skin scrape. You can do a fecal test. Um, you want to rule that out, but um, you might just see the psychogenic alopecia. And that is something that might go away in a home, but if it's still such a stressful situation, the cat might need further, further care with a veterinarian um, talking about ways to reduce stress. Um, this is a, I don't even know, an Akita breed possibly um, that has this kind of generalized hair loss catchiness all over all over his body, um, doesn't necessarily look infected or, um, or demodectic at this moment. Of course, you would rule all of that out, but you do, in these older dogs, um, you do have to worry about endocrine disorders that can cause hair loss, nondescript hair loss like this that you can't find any other reason for. Um, simple blood work might tell you if a dog's hypothyroid, so they can lose their hair with hypothyroidism. Um, more expensive blood work can tell you if the dog has uh, Cushing's disease, which is hyperadrenal corticism, which means that they have too much cortisol in their system, which would cause the hair loss as well. Um, some of the other signs of that would be eating a lot, drinking a lot, urinating a lot, just because they have the increased steroids. So you do see other signs of that, but it's something that if you can't find anything and you and you and your veterinarians has treated everything, that they might they might go on to do a additional blood test or recommend that the new adopter do the blood test. I, not quite sure how everybody's um, adoption protocol are, but just to know that there are some other, other reasons why you can have hair loss. Um, this is our hound, one of our hound dogs. This is a while back. You can see that he, she has some, I think it was, he has some, some redness to, her, to his skin. There's some um, alopecia, which is hair loss around the ears, around the eyes, around the back, the dorsum, down the legs. I don't think there's any hair on his legs, his back legs. Um, so I think we diagnosed him with Demodex and then with a secondary bacterial infection because that looks like it's in, infected with um, 
with some things that the skin's all red and crusty. But I just wanted to see you the progression. So now he is happy in a home, completely fine with our treatments, doing well. So these animals, again, can be adopted without any worry. Um, briefly, embedded collars, we see them We see them here. You probably see them there. Um, animals that are out, outside too long or kept on a or collar or grow into their collar, unfortunately, um, it will just grow, in, grow into their skin and their skin will grow around it. Um, these ideally would be clipped and cleaned. So the proper way to clip and clean a wound is to place some sterile Vaseline in an area um, and then clip around it. The Vaseline is there so that none of the other hair will get into the wound. Um, so clip around it, get all the hair from, from being able to penetrate into the wound to cause further damage, and then, um, and then clean it up with some disinfectant, some some safe disinfectant that you can use on the skin, like chlorhexidine. Um, and then they do, they do pretty well. You could put a bandage on it. Sometimes the bandages don't stay on these embedded collars. If it looks nice and healthy, you can, you can leave it clear. Um, honey is a good, safe thing that you can use on wounds. Um, honey will debride. It's just table honey. I know it's expensive now, but it's just table honey, and you can use it. You can put it on the wounds, and it'll debride the dead tissue and also cause um, have an area of antibacterial properties um, and keep everything clean. So again, these protocols need to be written by your veterinarian so that they um, can give you the proper training and understanding of, of why you're doing things and, and when you should do things and, and such like that. But um, they, they heal very well, and it's uh, great before and after pictures. I don't think I have any after pictures of those guys, unfortunately. Um, we see a lot of matted fur here. Um, this is a somewhat an emergency situation when they come in with matted fur. This dog on the left was found um, in a plus mud pit. So I don't know if anyone's from South Carolina, but there's this really stinky mud that's along the marshes and the rivers around here. And the dog was stuck in, in the plus mud because so it's like quicksand kind of material. So he came in severely matted with plus mud all over him. He was completely wet, so it was an emergency situation because we needed to get those mats um, away from his skin so that it doesn't provide a focal area of bacterial and fungal growth. So to prevent infections on the skin, it's ideal to get the mats off of the fur. So oftentimes sedation is needed, so your veterinarian would need to be involved. If you have a veterinary clinic, you could take them, take them to you immediately. You could try to bathe them. It's really hard to bathe animals with matted fur. so. Um, the quick and easy way to do it is just to, to remove those mats with um, grooming clippers. So he took three hours to groom, and that's what he looks like now. Um, we call him Muddy Waters, I think is what we call him. Um, I think this is one of the last, well, maybe two of the last pictures. But um, this is a dog that we had under anesthesia, and we didn't even notice that he had a stick in his mouth um, when he was there for an initial exam until we put him under anesthesia. So if you have animals that are chewing on things in, in the outside area and they're not eating very well, it's always ideal to look in the mouth. Um, your veterinarian will, will certainly do it, but if you if you feel safe to look in the mouth, you can always catch this pretty early um, to understand what's going on. Uh, this particular stick has been in there for a long time. As you can see, it's caused damage to the area gingiva and even the hard palate, which is the top of the mouth of this poor dog. Um, and has caused it to be infected. So some antibiotics, we didn't do anything surgically, nothing was really, really open. Um, it disclosed to the new adopters that these teeth might not be viable in the future, might need to be removed, um, just so that they are aware that they need to follow up with their veterinarian. Um, since we have time, I'll show you this. So this is a perineal hernia. So if you see weird masses around the anal region of the dogs, um, we worry about hernias. So a hernia is an abnormal hole in a area that's not supposed to have a hole. So this is a hole in the, the rectum that has caused feces and things to come out of the rectum and then um, into the skin area, or it's caused the, that part of the intestines, the colon, to come out through the skin as well. So um, I would not encourage anybody sticking a needle in this. Take a radiograph, make sure... Um, you know you know what you're sticking a needle in before. I had a, a, a tech come to me and want to stick a needle in this to see what it was, and I, um, it was very concerning to me that, that she would go ahead and do that. But 
um, worry about any kind of masses around the rectum being uh, a hernia or um, a cancerous mass or something. So just just to end on a not so pretty picture, maybe we can go back to one of our our, our success stories. But I um, hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, ask them when you're here or send us an email. Thanks.